Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Adams Farm Community Church this morning. We're gathered here to worship the Lord in community. And that song is just, uh, as I sat, stood there, not sat there, but stood there uh, listening to the words of that song, I'm just really a little overwhelmed at the amazing love that God has for us. Little specks of dust in this universe, right? And yet he loves us so much that he's standing there with those open arms to bring us in with our failures, our addictions, all these things, but he doesn't just forgive us and care about us. He changes us, you know? He doesn't say, come in and you're forgiven. He says, you're forgiven and don't continue in that lifestyle, right? It's amazing to think that we get to uh, come together and worship him in community this morning. My name's Jeff Welch, I'm one of the elders here, and it's my privilege uh, to present the call to worship with you this morning. Before I do that, I do want to ask you, if you're visiting with us, if you'll just look around, you'll see some of these little tablets sitting on the end of some aisles. If you'd fill that out for us and let us register your visit, 
and uh, just have the opportunity to pray for you, to contact you if you would be open to that. We would appreciate it. Our call to worship this morning is based on Psalms 147 and Isaiah 40, and this is a responsive reading. Gather us in, the brokenhearted and the joyful, together. Gather us in, the weak and the strong. Gather us in, the fearful and the brave. Gather us in, the young and the old. Gather us in to sing of God's works together. Gather us in to praise Jesus Christ. Gather us in to worship and wonder. Gather us in to know of God's love. Let's continue our worship in song.
Whatever it is that we have named as an idol in our lives above you, Lord, let today be the day that we come to you and say, uh, uh, enough is enough, I can't do this anymore. Lord, would you hear now our prayers of silent confession as we take those words of the psalmist and make them our own. We ask you to search our hearts and to show us if there's any error in our ways. Hear us, Lord. Seek the cornerstone today, Jesus Christ. You use us to build up your temple of praise. And Father, as we cling to those words, that assurance of pardon, you tell us that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's in the name of Jesus that we pray today. Amen. Let's respond in praise with our doxology. We share a summary of our beliefs, the essentials, as told in the Apostles' Creed, as described, just not told in the Apostles' Creed, described in the Apostles' Creed, stated in the Apostles' Creed. It's not a fairy tale or a story, is it? It's just the truth. Uh, so church asked you this morning, what is it that we believe? Amen. If you'll be seated, please, we'll welcome Doug Farmer up for our ministry moment today. And Jamie Martin. Hey, and if you don't know Jamie Martin, you're missing a great blessing in your life. Oh. <laughs> your homework, your homework's getting to know this guy. He'll say he's an ordinary guy, and he is, but he serves and loves an extraordinary God. I work with the missions team, and a few months ago, Jamie came to me about a short-term mission opportunity for him, and he'll describe it in just a moment. Um, it was really exciting to all of us. He wasn't coming seeking help and support. He just, he said, I don't know what to do. I've answered this call and I don't know what to do. And so what has unfolded has been awesome. And now, today, we've commissioned him to leave, and he'll tell you all about when he's leaving and stuff, but he leaves this week for this opportunity. I've known Jamie a long time. One of my most enduring or strongest or whatever memories if you said what about Jamie Martin long before streaming and internet and all that stuff at Adams Farm Church if you missed a sermon on a given Sunday you could request a copy of the sermon on a CD so remember CD players you put it in your car while you're driving whatever and we would duplicate you know a half dozen or whatever for people some people even subscribed and they would get the sermon every week after a particularly evangelical sermon that really moved Jamie one day, he came to me and he said, can we duplicate CDs and put in every single mailbox in Adam's farm? This is the burden that's on this guy's heart about the gospel and the message and the cause for Christ. 
So he'll describe for a couple seconds or minutes or even an hour um, <laughs> what he's going to be doing, and then with the pastor, uh, we'll commission him for his service. So I um, joined the Navy in 1989, and I uh, was a trained dental assistant uh, in the Navy. And uh, after s six years of dental, um, dental assisting, it was time for me to get out, and, and my thought was, who's going to hire a male dental assistant? And uh, they told me that the only um, accredited dental repair program in the world was in the Navy. And um, it was very, very difficult to get into. Um, I applied, make a long, super long story short, I got in, became class president, just became my thing. So I've been fixing dental equipment now. I've been in dentistry for 34 years. And the, just to give you an idea, when I graduated from that dental program, there was only 52 of us that covered the whole globe in the Navy. So I had the whole Northeastern United States, very specialized. Um, last year, I lost both my parents and started, you know, really considering where God, you know, they say God gives you gifts, and I'm thinking, what's my gift? You know, well, shoot, my gift is fixing dental equipment, to be honest. So, <laughs> so I started looking around, um, started praying about opportunities, and as God would have it, I think it was the next day, a dentist that had just completed a trip to Ecuador brought some equipment to me and asked me if I wouldn't mind taking a look at it. And it, my heart started stirring in me and just started burning. And, uh, and he's saying, hey, I'll give you a little money. I'm like, no, we're not going to do any of that. I said, I'll just do it to support your mission. I said, hey, to further support your mission, if you ever need a dental assistant, trained equipment repair guy you know, in Ecuador, consider me. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. And he said, hey, I'll pay your way, I'm, your food, your lodging, everything is fully supported. And he said, I just want you to go there and clean teeth. I cleaned teeth my first year in dentistry. And then I went to him about a month later and said, what kind of tools should I bring with me? He said, tools? Jamie, you understand you're going to clean teeth. I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's good. I'm excited to get chair side again. That, that's, that's exciting by me. And praying about it. And now this has turned into us building a full-fledged dental clinic in Ecuador. So now I'm not cleaning teeth anymore. <laughs> I may be, and that would be exciting to do. But we've been working for weeks and months to get equipment to Ecuador, um, working with them over the, over the phone and taking pictures and using the technology that we have today to try to get everything in line for me to go down there and install this dental equipment. The guy who I'm helping down there, his nephew graduates from dental school next year, and the idea is to have this dental clinic to be a place where other dental missionaries can come and, um, and, and treat people out of this dental clinic that we're going to um, build uh, next week. So it's a very exciting. Um, the dentist goes to a trip in Winston. Uh, there's 15 of us going. You know, we have medical, dental, pharmacy, you know, the whole nine yards. But um, I leave Wednesday, and um, Wednesday to Wednesday, and um, just really excited about the trip and really appreciate your support and your prayers for the, for the people that we're going to touch and, and the safety and uh, security of our team. Well, let's bring up, uh, I know we have some members of the missions team here today and also our elders, if you'll come up as we pray for Jamie in this coming week. And what day do you fly out? Wednesday. Wednesday. Uh, what a tremendous reminder to us that the Lord uses all, I mean, what a specific gift. He's not calling me to fix dental equipment. That's a wonderful thing that you're heeding the call. I'd like to read from, from uh, Romans chapter 14 as we prepare to pray for, for Jamie. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so, Jamie, we'll be praying that through your actions with dentistry and dental equipment, that will also open doors for you to share in your words as well. Uh, gentlemen, if we'll lay on hands on Jamie, and let's prepare him for his trip. And gather around if we would. Yeah, yeah, come on in the middle. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today to be uh, commissioning a brother in Christ. To be going to a place that uh, probably most of us will never see. And to minister to faces that we will never know. 
And yet you have called him and you are equipping him day by day. We pray for safe travels, traveling mercies. We pray for Wendy and the family back home. We pray for all the details that come into a trip such as this. And pray that when he's on the ground that you would make his footsteps firm and his path clear. Uh, that you would help him to be sustained through ups and downs, uh, foul weather, setbacks, scheduling problems, tool issues, whatever it may be. And that the word of Jesus Christ through scripture would come through Jamie's actions, through his hands and his feet and his lips as well. And that you would remind him and awaken him to each opportunity that he has to make it clear of the special calling you've placed on him for this coming week and his trip to Ecuador. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.
thank you, Laura. Uh, we'll dismiss our children to the children's ministry at this time. If we open to John chapter 21, we're going to pick up in verse 15, and we'll be finishing out John's gospel today. And join me as we read God's word. John 21, 15 through 23, this is from the English Standard Version. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we open your word today, I pray that you would speak truth into our hearts and minds. <clears throat> you would pierce us to the very marrow of this glorious truth of John's gospel as we finish out this book today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the year is 1887. You'll see a few old school baseball folks on the screen there. American baseball isn't quite 20 years old. The Philadelphia Quakers, not yet the Phillies, but the Quakers, would go on to 16 consecutive wins. A pitcher for the Louisville Col uh, Colonels would strike out 17 batters in a single game using a new technique that he called the knuckleball. And batters would rejoice over a short-lived rule for that season alone that allowed them not three strikes, but four. Four strikes. The change uh, allowed batters to get used to another rule change that had resulted in a larger strike zone. That's about the limit of my knowledge on the whole issue. But the increase in bats and home, home runs and on bases and all that good stuff... Uh, it came at the price of slower games, among other problems. And in a, in a sport that is very rich with traditions and rules and even superstitions, one writer summarized the short-lived rule like this. He said, four strikeouts just seemed unnatural. So eventually they got rid of that. Uh, of course, strikes and three strikes is not unique to baseball. Uh, on a more serious note, believe it or not, it's a very rich biblical heritage of three strikes. Amos chapter 1 mentions the three transgressions of Damascus. Amos chapter 2 mentions the three transgressions of Israel. Job speaks of God's process of restoring three times. Take a look at Job 3 here. Behold, God does all these things twice and three times with a man to bring back his soul from the pit that he may be lighted with the light of life. This three strikes mentality is what Peter has in mind when he tries to impress Jesus in Matthew 18. You might remember this. He says, Lord, I'll forgive my brother however many times it takes. I'll, I'll do it better than three times. How about if I forgive him seven times? And you know Jesus' response here. Matthew 18, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And so it's not lost on us that Peter, the seven times forgiver, has denied Jesus three times. At this point in John's gospel. You remember that he denied Jesus by the embers of that charcoal fire. We talked about this a little bit last week. And Peter, the, the seven times boaster. He will seemingly undo his entire relationship with Jesus Christ. 
in three I am not statements. I do not know him. I am not him, right? And so it is with great symbolism that Christ now invites Peter to speak with him around the embers of another charcoal fire. And he gives Peter a three-part restoration to his three strikes. For all this talk, though, of of three strikes and 70 times seven, I, I don't want us to overlook a complimentary truth, and I don't want you to misapply anything. When it comes to salvation, maybe you can help me out, church. How many times do I have to get saved? Once. Yeah. Hebrews 7, he sacrificed once for all when he offered himself. Jesus died once. He rose from that tomb once. He ascended once and he will return again. Hebrews 10, by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What are those last three words, church? Once for all. Don't forget that as we're talking about this. Don't forget that once for all. You do not have to beat yourself up or wallow in shame and guilt because when you cry out to Jesus once for all, you receive that salvation once for all, justified once for all. So I dare say that in John 21, Peter has already been forgiven. He already knows of the once for all sacrifice. He has witnessed the risen Jesus Christ. He has continued to serve along with the disciples. And he's even blessed us by seeing this wonderful uh, fish catch miracle for that morning. You remember they caught the fish as they see Jesus here on on the shoreline. So I would dare say Peter has been forgiven, but he has not been Restored. He has not been recommissioned. He has not been reaffirmed. You, you know how that goes in life. You know, you're, you're forgiven, but things aren't quite right. You've sensed that. And so I want you to think back to Matthew 16, the very first time that Simon is called by his new name. That is Peter. It literally means stone or rock. And this is where I'm supposed to put a joke about the rock and, uh, you know, the actor and the wrestler and all that. We're not even going to bother today. Just, yeah, you can just laugh at the idea of it all, right? Peter, the rock. Look here at Matthew 16. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now Simon Peter speaks for the whole group here. He says, you are the Christ You are the son of the living God. He represents this blessed, unique insight that often shows up in natural leaders. And so Jesus tells them, you know, you may be Simon, Jonah's son, but my heavenly father has revealed to you that you are Peter, the rock. We know from later passages, the rock here upon whom Christ will will build his church. It is It is uh, epitomized in Peter. It's personalized in Peter. But it is not limited to Peter. Ephesians 2 talks about how the church is built on the foundations of of all the apostles and prophets. We are inheritors of the rock, in other words. But Peter is the face of the truth. The poster child, you might say. And that's why it's so devastating when it is Peter who denies Jesus Christ three times. We had our baseball metaphor. He's the team captain. He's the one with the sponsorship. And now he has fallen. And he has the potential to take down the whole team with him. And this whole group of disciples will not truly flourish again until Peter and Jesus make their peace. 
And so Jesus begins this process as others look on and he later as he walks with Peter one-on-one. And that's where we find ourselves today. Look at verse 15, John 21. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Did you catch that? He's not calling him Peter anymore, is he? Peter had once enjoyed that special nickname that Jesus had given him. The rock. And what does Jesus call him here? Simon. Son of John. Son of Jonah, depending on the the dialect here. There is no, I tell you, you are Peter. There is no, oh, my Father in heaven has revealed this to you, Peter. He's lost his standing. He has not lost Jesus' love, right? Make that clear in your heart. You, you may, you know, you may lose your, I don't even, I'm, I'm a, I don't want to get in trouble theologically. What, what am I trying to say? You can, you know, you can lose your flourishing, maybe we'll put it that way. But you haven't lost your forgiveness. Does that make sense? You know? Might the same be true for you and me? Yes. I sense it when I'm going through the motions in my own power. Maybe I haven't outright denied Christ three times. I haven't denied Him with my words like Peter, but I'm denying Him in dozens of of small, little, minute ways. You'll hear it creeping in when we talk sometimes. I'll start using words like, oh, my church, my ministry, my plans, all those types of things, my family, my money, my time. None of it belongs to me. It's all belonging. It's all his, 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 right? You see that in your life. And so Jesus then takes me aside and he says, uh, Brian, Son of, my dad's name is John too, just like Simon Peter here. Son of John, son of Becky. You're acting like son of them, not my child. You're not acting like, you know, caretaker of your home and Laura's husband and Harrison's father and Adam's farm pastor. You're acting, your only child is showing. That's what we say in, in my, I'm an only child and I can acknowledge it that it shows up every now and then, Right? Some of you have experienced that. My only child syndrome. Now, have you ever had Jesus to take you through those types of circumstances? And he says, he finally says, enough is is enough. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Has he asked you that question in your life? More than these. Scholars have written, what what is Jesus referring to? You can see him you know, with his arms waving. Do you love me more than these? Is he talking about all the fishing boats and the, the nets and all the glorious fish catch? Is he talking about all the distractions and the worldly supplies? Most likely he's talking about the other disciples. You remember that it was Peter who had said that, uh, that, that those other disciples, he had said to the Lord, hey, they will all fall away, Jesus, but not me. This is Matthew 26. I will never fall away. And so Jesus is having to say, hey, these guys that you thought would fall away, you know, how's that looking right now? You used to be Peter. You used to be the rock, not just for me, but for them. Do you love me more than they do? Can you, can you lead them as they need you to? And so this op- opening question, it shows where Jesus is headed here. Full restoration. Full shepherding. Full leading. Full discipling ministry. There's no demotion. There's no riding the bench. He's not going, he's, he's not going to have to sit it out. He's going back to the starting lineup. And Peter knows the answer. Do you love me more than these? Well, Jesus, for the last week or two, really, honestly, the answer is probably No. You cannot deny the teacher and remain the student. You cannot abandon the leader and remain a follower. You can't ignore the Savior and then expect to lead others to salvation. And so Jesus asks here, 
of love, out of love. And Peter responds with love. But there's a curious wordplay that goes on here that, that we have debated about for centuries now. Take a look here in verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Simon, uh, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love, the Greek word here is agapos, me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love, that is philo, you. Or phi philo. I don't remember now. <laughs> I should have looked that up and started preaching about it, I guess. Let's say philo for today. How's that sound? Agapos and philo. Two different kinds of loves are talked about right here. Jesus verbalizes this agape love while Simon Peter affirms a philo love. Now I want to be careful here because all throughout John's gospel he uses these words for love interchangeably. And so there's not, I mean we don't want to go too deep here. But there is a difference here, right? We don't want to overemphasize the difference, but there is a difference, and this is God's Word. And so if we just were to take it at face value here, then Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me with the beloved esteem of life through God's will and God's power? Do you love me, Peter, in the love by which Christ is described when we talk about God is love in John 4. Do you love me with that kind of love, Peter? And then Peter responds with, yes, Lord, I love you with, the, with affectionate friendship and kinship. Philadelphia, right? Philly, the city of brotherly, supposedly brotherly love. <laughs> Like I said, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but, you know, you don't want to overemphasize it. Let me bring up John MacArthur. I thought, I thought he had a, a poignant way of talking about this. He says, Peter was, perhaps, reluctant to make a claim of supreme devotion when in the past his life did not support such a claim. And Jesus pressed home to Peter the need for unswerving Devotion by repeatedly asking Peter if he loved him supremely. Jesus demands total commitment from his followers. Particularly because Jesus talks about this phileo love in his last question to Peter. And so Jesus switches to Peter's word for love. As if to say, Peter, can you... Can you even claim to love me with such brotherly love? If you won't affirm agape love, can you even claim philo love? Now, however it is that these men speak about love for one another, you see that Jesus asked Peter in such a way that Peter has to confess it three times. Three times Peter denied Jesus Christ. And now three times Peter must affirm Christ. Are there times in your life when you know the truth, but you have to affirm the truth? Is, does that happen in you? You know it, but you've got to feel it. You've got to say it. You've got to, you've got to affirm that. Aren't there times when Jesus knows your heart, but he has to make sure that you know your heart? He has to take you to a place where you're awakened to that, that, that happens all the time. And so with these three questions of love, Jesus includes three affirmations of purpose. Look at here. Uh, look here. Uh, this is right in 21, 15, 16, and 17. He says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. There are shades of meaning within this purpose. Linguists talk about the third affirmation. It could even be translated as little lambs. Feed my little lambs. Lambs, showing that Simon Peter uh, needs to minister to everyone from lambs to sheep to little lambs. We'll, we'll leave it there for today. But I want you to think about two things. First, whose sheep are they? And second, what is Simon Peter to do with these sheep? First, whose sheep are they? It's, they're Jesus' sheep, right? They're God's sheep. He is the chief Shepherd, Peter himself affirms this in 1 Peter 5. He addresses the uh, presbyteros. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, 
And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Our chief shepherd, and he calls the under shepherds. I was just reminded, uh, Hugh signs his elder emails as the sheepdog, <laughs> right? He's like, well, God's a shepherd. I'm just the sheepdog, right? And so they will, they will be called. These men are called. They will fail. But the chief shepherd has his plan for his sheep. The eternal shepherd claims them for himself. My sheep, my sheep, my sheep. And we forget this in a couple of ways when we are ministering to one another in a church community. First is that we, we claim all the success of the sheep for ourselves. And second is the flip side of that. We claim all the weaknesses of the sheep for ourselves. When we talk about our prayer of confession on a Sunday morning, you'll note that nobody up here is praying a confession on your behalf. We're only praying for ourselves. You can only claim confession and repentance in your own heart. You can't do that for anyone else. And as much as I would like to claim uh, victory for Jamie going to Ecuador, God called Jamie. I had nothing to do with that, right? But you see it happen in, in churches especially when we start to claim those types of things. And so Jesus, though, he willingly chose to entrust his sheep to people like Simon Peter. But we must never forget that they are his sheep. Let's shift back to Simon Peter for a moment here. This is the same Simon Peter, the same Peter who boasted over all the other disciples in Matthew 26. This is the same Peter, if you flip over to Galatians 21, Peter plays favorites in the church to the point where Paul has to write and he says, I opposed Peter to his face. Uh, Galatians, excuse me, Galatians 2, uh, starting there in verse 11, if you'd like to read when you get home. I mean, that's in the Bible, right? These guys opposed each other to their faces. And yet, Christ is still calling Peter. That's remarkable to me. He's still calling Peter. God's called me to serve. He's called you to serve. He, says, he calls Peter and he uses Peter through his faults instead of in spite of his faults. Because the same impulsive attitude that makes Peter, such a bonehead, also makes him quite bold for the Lord. There's a number of disciples I'm not sure I'd want to really hang out with, honestly, and Peter's probably one. I bet he comes on a little strong, right? Yeah. And so Jesus is going to use that same boldness to minister to thousands of first century Christians. The day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people, actually probably a little more than that, they come to Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit works through the preacher. Who is the preacher? It's Peter. What a remarkable thing. And so Jesus commands Simon Peter to feed and tend his flock. Feed and tend. These have these nuances of meaning, these shades of, of meaning here. Feeding is from a Greek word that means uh, pasturing, grazing, prolonged nourishment. And so the elders here are called to provide food and nourishment to Jesus' sheep. And so, yeah, they, they, they can encourage those who aren't Jesus' sheep. They can provide snacks at times when the sheep's not ready for a full meal. But the calling of the elder here through Peter is to feed the sheep of the great shepherd with that nourishing, solid food. Tending is the other word here. It's from a Greek word meaning organizing and holding in order. And so you see that Jesus is calling Peter. He's calling the leaders of the church here. That in addition to their feeding duties, they must also shepherd and herd the flock. They must be like sheepdogs as we were talking about. Gentle yet firm. And three times Jesus affirms this. Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep, feed my lambs. Let me paraphrase another here. If Jesus must repeat it a third time, he may as well repeat it every single day of our lives. Does that make sense to you? 
Maybe it's like a, the concept of if, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. If Jesus tells us three times, feed, ten, feed, he may as well tell us every single moment of the life when he has called us. Charles John Ellicott writes here, Our Lord's words would seem to address him as one who had fallen from the steadfastness of the rock man and had been true rather to his natural than to his apostolic name. Does that ever happen with you? If you are saved in the name of Jesus, your name, your last name is Christian. Your name is Christ follower. Do you live up to that apostolic name or do you fall into your old habits? Uh, it happens to all of us. And so this three-part restoration to the one he calls Simon, there's no longer a reference to any name at all as this chapter continues. John's gospel just starts calling him Peter. What a, what a nice little detail there. The, the rock man is restored. He is Peter once again. But being Peter comes with a price. Jesus prophesies that Peter will die one day, as we all do. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And, and so John clarifies this, he said, to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said, follow me. Well, Boy, it's Jesus, you're laying it on thick, right? right? Peter, you're restored, you're going to die, now come with me. That's not really the, the hopeful uh, sunshine and roses message we want to hear. But Peter is restored. And so, yes, he will, he will die, he will be crucified according to historical records. Uh, tradition says he was crucified upside down, we just don't know that for sure, a lot of scholars uh, debate that embellishment, but we know he was crucified. And our takeaway is this, that even in this death, he is to glorify God. And so, and, and let, me, let me add on a few minutes today. I guess we're, we're running just slightly over, but bear with me because we want to finish this book today. If Jesus were to say all this to you as you walked along the shoreline after this charcoal breakfast... Most likely, if you're like me, I would just remain quiet, right? I'd be pondering. I'd be thinking. What does Peter do? Look at verse 22. He sees John following at a distance. And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? You follow me. How quickly Peter falls into his old ways. John's conclusion here even implies that it's probably Peter who spreads a rumor about John that John is going to live forever. If you're following along in scripture, you'll see that. It turns out John does outlive the other disciples, but he dies eventually. He's exiled on Patmos and it goes on from there. But Jesus says, John is not a concern to you. I'm talking to you, buddy. You follow me. And so the question then that we have for us as we're walking with Jesus along the shoreline is, you know, what is your journey? Does this happen to you? What about this guy, Jesus? What about that, that lady? And he says, no, 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 I'm talking to you today. You know, you follow me. Maybe you need to be restored in the grace of Jesus Christ today. Maybe you've denied him three times or 30 times or 300 times. And you can smell that fragrance from the charcoal. He's welcoming you, welcoming you to the, the shore. And he wants you to come along just as Peter said. And, and, and can you say as Peter said, yes, I love you, Jesus. And then Jesus would have to say, do you really? Yes, I love you, Jesus. And Jesus would have to say, no, listen, do you really? That third one's always tough, isn't it? Let me conclude here. John 21, verse 24. And so John concludes about himself that he is the disciple bearing witness. Verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. 
And who has written these things? And we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. You know, you and I did not walk along the shoreline with Jesus. We weren't there to see Peter in person or to, to walk with John or have any questions about him. But this is the story that continues to be written in that sense. A story written in your heart and in my heart. A story of restoration and fall and then restoration once again. A story of justification, that once and for all sacrifice. And then that lifelong of sanctification, becoming more like Christ, less like ourselves. Dying to self a little bit each day. And so that is the question. Can you hear Jesus saying to you, feed my sheep? Can you hear Jesus saying to you, follow me? Don't worry about the other fella. Don't worry about the other gal. I want you to follow me. Walk with me along this shoreline. I promise you, you will die one day. But even in death, you will glorify God. If you're in the name of Jesus Christ, follow me, he says. And that's my hope for us today. Let's continue to love him. Let's continue to follow him as we close in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, would you speak to our hearts today. We have studied this book off and on now for three years. I pray that it would resonate, that this would not just be a Bible study, but a, but a heart study, a soul study. Lord, I pray that your gospel, that it would be so saturated in our hearts that we would be able to speak of it just as John does here and, 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 and excitedly say to others the stories, the endless stories in our own hearts. That would fill reams and reams of paper and libraries for eternity. For each person in this room to exit through these doors knowing the name of Jesus Christ written on their hearts. Walking with you along the shoreline. Enjoying the presence that they have with you until that one day as we will all be called home to heaven one way or the other in the name of Christ, either through, through death or your return. And yet your words to each of us individually is, follow me. Lord, let us follow you. Father, as we close with our prayer of thanksgiving and supplication, we do give thanks as we have earlier this morning just for gathering us here, for keeping us strong in our church budget and excited in our, uh, our brother who's going to Ecuador uh, enthusiastic in our various committee meetings and deacons meetings and elders meetings, Lord. So many wonderful things happening behind the scenes here. We thank you even for practical matters, our new, our new roof. We do not take that for granted, Father. And Father, as we close also in supplication, giving these things to you. I know of at least two of our students awaiting surgery in the coming days. We pray for their families, for them, those, those young hearts. Grant them a peace that transcends understanding. We pray for the news as we've just heard more tragedy in Israel. Uh, we, we pray for uh, the stabbing and, and boon. I mean, all these things, Lord, remind us to hold, uh, to be held close in your spirit when we are weighed down with the dangers and the troubles and the snares that surround us. Let us look to you. And as Peter did, let us follow you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and respond in song.
As you go with God today, be sure to make note, many things coming up very soon. Uh, the trip to Bon Clarken on April 17th with our men's ministry. The women's ministry, my favorite things, April 18th. The spaghetti dinner, April 19th with an RSVP, April 12th, which is coming up. And today's uh, baby sprinkle, baby showers for the first child. Baby sprinkles for the second child. I learned that. I'm so excited to learn something new this week uh, with Shelby Barton. So let's be um, remembering all these wonderful things coming up. Until we see each other again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.